Welcome everybody to the, to the afternoon session. Um, we start with uh, the final invited talk of uh, SPIN, uh, which is given by a direct colleague of mine, Tim Willemse. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce him. Uh, he was a PhD student in Eindhoven from 1998 to 2002. Uh, then he was a researcher in the European project, after which he worked as a uh, postdoc uh, closely uh, connected to ASML. Um, after that he started working on uh, um, the verification of reactive and timed systems using parameterized Boolean equation systems, which may still appear also in this talk, not sure. Um, Furthermore, he's a director of the Dutch Computer Science Research School on uh, programming and algorithmics. And um, his research interests are, besides PBASs, uh, algorithms, well, uh, the algorithms and theory of PBASs, parity games, uh, model based testing, and applications of model checking. Uh, in particular, he applies these techniques with uh, the MCRL2 model checker, which is the uh, model checker developed here in Eindhoven in the formal system and analysis uh, group. Um, but mostly connected to the talk that he's giving today is his part-time affiliation with CERN. And um, he will talk about the challenges involved with um, getting the control software for the Large Hadron Collider, correct? Let's switch. Yep. Uh, thank you, Anton. Uh, so indeed, I'm Tim Willemse. Uh, and I'm going to talk about verification challenges that uh, arise in, let's say, the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, a lot of people, several people from CERN, uh, Frank Lege, Yiling Wong, uh, Bobby uh, Garrido, Lorenzo, uh, Clara Gaspar, who developed part of this uh, control system uh, language that you're going to see, and then also some people from, uh, from Eindhoven University, a uh, former PhD student of mine, Jeroen Kere, uh, Sander Lehmans, who happens to be there in the audience too, um, Vincent Custis from Zurich, and uh, Daniela Remenskra from uh, NICAF in, in Amsterdam. Uh, so the work that I'm going to present here today is not just about the control system, but it's also going to be about the uh, uh, data uh, acquisition system that they have and the uh, data management system that they have. And this is, uh, well, uh, joint work, the last, the last part is joint work with uh, Daniela Remenska. And all of this was carried out actually between 2010, essentially, and uh, now. Right, so you see, you see some of the work of the past and, and current work. Okay, um, I suppose most of you actually no CERN, right? You've heard about CERN and uh, you've heard about the Large uh, Hadron Collider. Uh, so CERN is actually a European collaboration for nuclear physics uh, research and it's, uh, well, very nicely situated here on the border of uh, France and, and Switzerland uh, with a very nice view on, on the Alps that you see there. Right? It's a very nice location that they have. Uh, so it's founded in 1954 uh, by 12 uh, founding members, 21, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 12 member states, and uh, currently I think there are up to 21 member states that are involved in CERN in some way or another. So it's, uh, it's actually a large collaboration between uh, a very large group of physicists. Uh, so currently they have between, well, let's say, more than 2,000 staff members, but if you visit these uh, CERN premises, there's always uh, going to be like 13,000 people on there working on closely uh, related topics with uh, the Large Hadron Collider. Right, so this Large Hadron Collider, which is actually uh, the thing that they uh, dug underneath uh, the, the, uh, uh, the ground here, so to say, uh, is, um, well, you can see that better here. So it's 100 meters below the ground. There's a, a big circle that you find there. And this, was, this is what they dug, and this is uh, a big tunnel which uh, is used to uh, send out particles and allow them to smash into each other. Right? So this tunnel was actually dug somewhere in, uh, what was it, 1988. So they, they finished it somewhere in 1988. It's a 27-kilometer tunnel 
uh, and it's uh, rather big, so to say. Uh, it took quite some years to actually finish that. It was there not just for the Large Hadron Collider, but it was a previous experiment, the um, uh, Large Electron Positron uh, Collider experiment, uh, particle uh, experiment that they did. And um, for the Large Hadron Collider, they reused these, uh, these, this big tunnel that they made. So inside this tunnel, you'll find equipment such as this one. And this is just a uh, what worked out, worked open version. So the beams essentially go through the beams, the particle beams that they have go through these tubes that you see there. Okay, and, and all of these uh, things that, that go round are essentially uh, controlled in the control room. So this is a picture of the control room. I visited that in 2009, just after there was this uh, uh, big smash that they had. There was the Large Hadron Collider being temporarily shut down uh, for some cleaning. And uh, we had a guided tour through the uh, control room at that point. It was quite nice, actually. So, um, I actually... I should go forward. Okay, well, actually, what you can see here is that there is a number of experiments uh, that are being connected to this Large Hadron Collider, and these are the ones that I'm going to be talking about, actually. Right, so this is one of such an experiment. Uh, it's actually an experiment there means it's a large, very large detector, uh, and the detector is, is built to uh, detect certain events after smashing two particles. Uh, against one another after colliding them. And uh, the size of these is actually massive. So if you look at this entire thing, this is the CMS experiment. There are four large experiments. Uh, CMS is one of them. It stands for the uh, uh, Compact Muon Solenoid uh, Experiment. Uh, if you can read this, it says that it's, um, uh, I think it's roughly 25 meters in width and 15 meters in diameter and it weighs somewhere near 15,000 tons of, uh, well, it's, it's largely electronics and all sorts of stuff. And there's superconducting uh, material in there, so the temperature inside these experiments is really, and inside this ring is really, really low. It's uh, somewhere even lower than some of the uh, temperatures you find out in outer space. Uh, so to control all, all of that, that's actually a big challenge. Now, the first evidence of, uh, so all of this was actually built to detect particles, got like particles, right? So you all knew the news that in 2012 they actually found some kind of uh, particle that they uh, were, that fitted the, the Higgs boson that was predicted. Right? So, so here's actually a picture of this entire device that you see there. This is just a, 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 an animation, a drawing of it. This is the thing in real life, right? So it does look massive. If you look at it like that, this is another picture of that, and you see the small people standing here, right? Compared to the huge equipment that you have there, right? uh, I think I was standing there at the time as well. So it's uh, a pretty impressive sight if you look down and just see the very small uh, details going on in here. So it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, so what happens if these uh, particles collide? Well, then essentially. What happens is that there's a, a lot of different particles being created, and they, all, of, all of those are being detected. And uh, this is actually how they found the Higgs, uh, the Higgs boson at some point. At least there's a claim that there is a particle that behaves like the Higgs was found in, uh, in 2012. And uh, currently they're actually reusing this uh, experiment and the, the whole setup to detect all sorts of new particles, uh, and obviously also to try to uh, uh, confirm the existence of this Higgs-like boson that they found. Okay, so there's quite a number of challenges going on there. Right? So there's uh, a massive amount of electronics, and obviously all these electronics need to be controlled. And the way this is done is essentially through software. Right? So there's a big software uh, fabric, essentially, to control and monitor all these detectors. That's right? most just here everything that goes on in this uh, Large Hadron Collider. There's a lot of firmware involved there. There's uh, PLCs involved there. Um, there's also going to be lots of data that is being produced by the collisions that you have. I'm going to talk about the collisions and the data that's produced afterwards. So, uh, I would to first zoom in on, on some of the earlier work that we did with the, uh, uh, with the Large Hadron Collider involving the software and control and monitoring of the hardware.
Okay, so the setup that they have is actually quite interesting. So it's built on, on a, a rather standard uh, supervisory control and data acquisition system, uh, which is currently developed, I think, and maintained by Philips, uh, sorry, uh, Siemens. Uh, so it's uh, a SCADA PVSS2, and it essentially provides runtime database uh, in which all the information is actually stored and state information is stored and things like that. But it also provides ways in which you can actually generate alarms and handle these alarms. Um, it also allows you to do some archiving, except for there's no way in which you can actually easily specify the behavior of any of the uh, control that you would like to have. Uh, for that, they actually developed way back in the, I think in the, in the 80s already, so the end of the 80s, there, there was a language called state managers, or a concept called state managers, which allowed them to uh, specify the control that they needed to have for the, uh, for the sensors and the, and the hardware. In, in a dedicated language. And this language had been improved and improved upon uh, until I think in 1998 they developed a framework called SMI++ which allowed you to model the behavior of, uh, of, of, these, uh, uh, of the system in a sense. And the way they do that is actually quite interesting. So what you have is a very hierarchical control so at the bottom you typically find all the sensors and everything that's associated with the uh, with, the, uh, with the hardware that you find in the detectors. And uh, on top of that, they just build very small blocks of software, which is kind of abstracting from some of the hardware details, sending out signals, and, and essentially discretizing the hardware. And all of this information is then propagated upwards and uh, accumulated into uh, smaller software blocks at a slightly higher level of abstraction. Uh, all the way up to, well, essentially the view that you can just switch on and switch off the system, right? Obviously, switching on and switching off such a detector just involves uh, switching on and switching off quite a number of sub-detectors, but at the top level, well, essentially what goes on is just a switch on and switch off, right? And if you look at the uh, CMS experiment, for instance, you'd find uh, in excess of 27,000 modules, or modules of this particular type, and each of these actually is, uh, is of a different type, and there's like over 560 different types that you could have uh, of this system. But if you do the abstraction, it's more or less like this, right? So there's an off and there's an on button, and it's beaming, right? So this SMI language that they developed was already developed partly for some of the exp uh, experiments that they actually did for... Uh, in, in the US uh, at the Delphi and Baba experiments. Right. Okay, so this hierarchical view, actually, we, we um, tried to understand what it looked like and what the structure was, right? And just going through a database of 27,000, or in one of the experiments, actually, the uh, LHCB experiment, which is another detector that they have. It's not 27,000, but it's six, more close to 60,000 uh, number of these uh, small modules, finite state machines, they call them. Right, so we wanted to understand uh, exactly how they cooperate and, and how, the structure, how they were structured, right? whether this was a very deep uh, hierarchy or whether this was a very, uh, very shallow but very wide spread. So what we made was actually uh, a bunch of pictures that uh, very nicely illustrated how the, uh, how the connections were, how far from the, the on-off switch essentially you are when you're control from the on-off button to the uh, lower level sensors. Right, so if look at, looking at the CMS experiment, we found that, well, it's actually not too, too big, right? So it's like 11 steps all the way down to, to, the, uh, to the leaves that you can find in, the, uh, in, in this hierarchy. Now, so the abstraction happens rather quickly. Right? So you go with big jumps in a sense. Uh, also, it, it looks in the CMS experiment, it, it was actually quite nicely structured, so it seems rather balanced. Uh, but there were other experiments that also have, the, for which we also produced these. Uh, for instance, for the LHCB, which uh, provided a lovely picture, so some, it was colloquially referred to as a flower. And we were wondering what happened here. So this is actually 
uh, something we didn't expect to see. And also they, at that very point, were surprised to see that the hierarchy that they had installed was actually of this particular shape. Uh, so this, uh, the explanation we later got for this big blob that they, that they identified here was that it was a high-level trigger farm, which was kind of a, uh, an isolated component, which consisted of one node, which has 56 sub-nodes, sub-farms essentially, which again had, each had uh, 28 PCs, which ran about 25 processes. And you see all that information, you see in instantly in such a picture, which is actually quite nice. And they, they, it allowed them to, to reason about their system in a certain way. Right? So this is just very informal in a sense, except for it's, it's just very visual. And this allowed us to also communicate easily with the engineers that are in, in this certain field. Okay, so there were more experiments, as I say, there was the Atlas experiment. Uh, also, that one looks rather nice. Right? Uh, and there was the Alice experiment, and there was also a big discussion about what this block was. Uh, can't recall, actually, what it was, so we never, I think, really got an answer uh, for that part. But also the engineers, actually, were intrigued by the fact that this part was there. Okay. So... The reason we were called in at a certain point was actually the following. So this was, for instance, again, the CMS experiment. Uh, and what would they would see in the control room is uh, that there would be a, a kind of an, a monitor that would indicate whether each of these uh, uh, nodes in this, in this graph that you see, or each of the finite state machines that you have in this, in this uh, control system, uh, would be working properly and in which state it would be. Right? Uh, and what they would see is that all of a sudden one of these would actually die. Right? So it wouldn't be responsive anymore. Something went wrong. And they couldn't explain exactly why this would happen. Uh, which is actually one of, the one of the things you would like to explore. And, and one of the ways to do that is to use model checking techniques. Right? Uh, so this is what we did. Um, so how do we do that, this model checking, right? Because it's, it's a massive system. It's uh, 30,000 systems in this, but uh, 27,000 to 30,000. It depended exactly on the moment of, uh, uh, of when you looked at the system. If it was uh, just had some maintenance, the number of, uh, of state machines that you would have would be typically increasing or decreasing. Right? And there would be maintenance uh, several times a year. Right, so the number of, of these, uh, the, the exact configuration of this hierarchy wasn't fixed, and the number of uh, finite state machines would increase or decrease, but it would always be extremely large, right? too large to actually uh, do some proper model checking, I would say. Um, uh, so we had a look at, uh, because we didn't quite understand the language as they defined it, we had a look at whether we could actually understand it using uh, the process algebra language that we developed here, 9.2 and 12.2. Right? So the language that we were looking at, these were the types of programs that we, that we had. Uh, so they were very structured in a sense, so just defined the class, so this kind of the behavior of a number of objects, the, the behavior of a particular object, and it would be in, uh, there would be a number of clauses saying uh, state, and there would be a number of clauses mentioning actions. Uh, but of course, this doesn't specify how things interact, right? So um, it, it just gives some kind of clue that there could be states called off, and that there could be some, uh, some actions that are called standby. We don't know the effect of that. And what you see here is actually that there are references to, uh, to things that you, well, that are not really local in a sense. Uh, so here what happens is that they are, for instance, referring to the state of particular other objects which are not local, right? so, but they're communicating with that. Okay, so what we tried to do is indeed understand this language that we had here and understand the examples that we have here. Uh, for that, we use the Amstrad 2 process algebra language. Now, this is ACP-style process algebra. I'm not going to bother you with too much of the details that we have here. Uh, There's uh, actually a language which allows you to describe parallelism. Um, it, is, uh, it, it uses non-determinism. Uh, there's multi-actions involved. There's a very rich data language, which was actually quite useful for modeling, yeah, as it turned out, this, uh, these LSML programs. Uh, the analysis that you can do is using mu calculus, uh, first-order extensions, actually, of mu calculus, because you need some way to deal with the data that you have. 
the analysis in the end, uh, the, the model shaking problems are typically translated to parameterized Boolean equation systems uh, solving, which is in a sense just uh, linear, uh, sorry, least fixed point logic, uh, which is first order logic extended with fixed points operators. So all of that is just uh, implemented in the tool set. Right, so, um, yeah, I think that's all I should say about MSL2 at this point. Um, so it's, it's had quite some development, and currently we're developing essentially uh, lots of things about uh, parameterized Boolean equation systems and um, mu calculus. And there had been a time in which we've been actively looking at visualization techniques. So you'll see some of the nice pictures and results that we've produced in, over the time uh, doing so. Okay, so back to this particular example that we have here. If we have such a program, we would try to understand how it works in, in Amstrad 2. Right. Okay, but first try to understand how such programs work in general. Right. So there's, uh, we were explained uh, that it would be essentially evaluating uh, the clauses that you had uh, that were indicated with the states. Uh, so it would be checking whether some of these clauses would actually be possible, and if so, it would actually be uh, um, acting upon that and re-evaluating the clauses again after that. If none of the clauses that you, in a particular state in which you were, would be evaluating to true, then, uh, so all guards would be false, only then you start acting on the commands that you've received. So you could have received some commands in the meantime, uh, but if you didn't, then you would start waiting for commands. Also, what could happen is that actually one of the uh, state machines in which you were supposed to interact with actually gives you back some fee uh, some state information and this might actually change some of the when clauses that you all had so you needed to re-evaluate all that. Right, so if that doesn't happen then uh, and, and you do receive a number of commands then you start executing these commands one by one and until the last command is executed the command queue becomes empty and you go back to the evaluation of the when clauses. Uh, so this entire scheme is actually fairly trans uh, straightforwardly translated to Amstrad 2, uh, except for that there is actually the notion of a three-value logic that they introduced, just to deal with the fact that sometimes these, uh, this configuration could be such that it would be reporting about empty sets of uh, nodes on which they would depend. Uh, so they would ask, uh, is this set of nodes of this particular type in is, is there any node of this particular type in the state error or, or state on? And if so, act as follows, except for when there would be no such, uh, so no such node of that particular type, in which case we as uh, computer scientists would usually say, well, the quantification over an uh, existential quantification over anti-domains just yields false, and they would just like to ignore that. So this kind of hampered the straightforward translation, and we needed to develop uh, a specific um, way of dealing with these uh, uh, Boolean expressions that they wrote down. In the end, this turned out to be possible, uh, but there, there, there were some subtleties in the, in the evaluation order and simplification order that you were supposed to do on these, evalu on these uh, Boolean clauses, because doing that in different ways would give you different answers. Uh, and that's typically something you don't want. Um, so what we got here, for instance, if you got in the end, if you got such uh, such a class, let's say chamber, and it would have a state as no uh, as not, it would actually translate to an actual two process of the following type. Right? Okay. So you see some of the information that you see here. State as not would actually be uh, uh, here. So is as not is actually a predicate on the, on the variable state, and it would also be a variable uh, some kind of predicate on. Uh, on, a, uh, on something which is either a phase or, uh, uh, sorry, which is actually either a when phase or, a, uh, uh, or an action phase, uh, just to model the two types of phases that the system could have, right, such, uh, such a finite state machine. Uh, so when the clause is evaluated true, one acts uh, as follows, one does a number of move to actions, meaning that one just switches to a new state, and you see an update of the state here. And otherwise, if this doesn't happen to be true, then otherwise we do something else. But this is all it essentially does. So the 
understanding of this SML, of an, of an SML program in isolation was fairly straightforward. Uh, but it was a bit difficult to analyze because it reasoned about, uh, actually it could reason about the states inside these conditions. Uh, C1, for instance, it could reason about the states, uh, state information about children. And there's no information about children or any nodes that are related to this particular node that we're studying here in this particular model. Right? So we need additional information. And for that, you actually need to have a look at the entire uh, structure that you see here. And this is what we did next. Right? So see whether we actually made a correct translation from the SML models to MSL2 we needed to put all of that uh, in, uh, together to make the to glue them together so that they together interact and show the desired behavior. Right? So what we did was uh, have a look at a subtree, for instance, a small constellation in MSL2, consisting of the wheels, sector, chamber, and, and a, n a number of uh, sensor controllers that we see here. Uh, we would just trip off all the other parts and uh, translate that to MSL2. Well, the first time we did that, we did that by hand, right? But in the end, that's, of course, not what you want. Uh, so we, tr we ultimately automated this entire transformation. Uh, for that. So that was actually a model transformation that we developed using uh, pretty old technology at the time because it was based on ASF-SDF, which had been discontinued in 2010 already. Uh, nevertheless, it served the purpose that we, uh, that we had. Um, before we actually built this transformation, we did a number of simulations and visualizations to see whether the system actually does what we wanted it to do, whether it actually modeled the system as we wanted it. Right? So the simulation did, for that we use uh, typical tools that come with the process algebra tool set, the MSL2 tool set. Uh, so just stepping through the uh, state space that you have. Um, looking for instance uh, for uh, move to actions, uh, whether it would be possible to actually move in a particular um, uh, FSM to a new state and uh, also keeping track of course with the state description that you have in your, uh, in your FSM, your state machine language program. Uh, so all of that seemed fine. Uh, also there's some, some very nice visualizations that you can do. So because the state space has become rather big, um, uh, I'll show you some numbers in a, in a few minutes. Um, it, it's very difficult to, to just visualize these, right? So you can visualize up to, let's say, 50, maybe 100 states, if you wish, uh, on, on a screen, and then you can get some information from that. But these were rather big, right? So this is maybe in the orders of millions of states. And then visualizing these state spaces become, well, it's virtually impossible, uh, except for we used uh, 3D technology to do so. Uh, which had been developed, uh, I think, at the end of uh, 98, maybe 2000 already. Um, and it allows you to inspect the state space and see where certain actions are possible. Uh, so here, for instance, you see in this simulation, you see the move to action. And here you see in the global state space, the top here would be the root node. And, and the further you go, uh, from the root node, the, the, the more you descend in this graph, right? You would see that the move to action would be possible here, but also on different uh, different uh, branches of the system. Right? So each branch here would indicate a number of uh, would indicate a decision. And by in analyzing these visualizations, we actually got some confidence into correctness of the system as well. Uh, so this, together with the uh, with the translation that we made here and the simulation that we got here ultimately gave us uh, the idea that we had understood the semantics of these uh, uh, of SML. Now I said that we made an automated translation. We did so using ASF SDF. In the end, this was too slow, right? So um, it, it took, I think, uh, several minutes actually to generate uh, the resulting MSL2 codes from just a few of these SML programs. And this is typically not something you would like. So we. Uh, at some point replace that with a far quicker implementation based on Python. Now obviously this didn't give you any information concerning the er errors that actually were found in the, uh, wh while doing the, uh, actually in, in the control room, right? So they, there's a number of issues they saw and we couldn't explain them, at least not in the particular example that we, uh, examples that we studied. 
uh, what we did was uh, we, we analyzed some of these uh, constellations using model checking. So we phrased a number of generic properties, like there's no dat lock or there's no life lock. Uh, some, all the commands that you send eventually have the possibility to propagate through to some of the lower levels. Uh, but it was also very hard to, to get information from the, the, the engineers as to what kind of requirements they really wanted because what they said was, well, the, the sensors, they don't give you any information whatsoever. They can flip into any, any state that you have and there's no way in which you, if you want to say switch on, it will actually do so. There's no guarantee that we can give you. Uh, so that also makes no sense to actually check. Um, so we did a number of these responsiveness properties, assuming that the hardware actually behaves as it's supposed to behave. Uh, but in the end, this is not really uh, very informative. Um, typically because they didn't, uh, well, uh, according to the engineers, uh, that, that was just an unreliable assumption that we made. Um, the constellations that we analyzed also didn't give us much of the uh, much conflicts in, in any of the other properties that we had. Uh, so we were still very far away from actually understanding what the problem actually might be, except for that we started to get a clue as to a, a, be a better understanding of, of the semantics of the language, um, which allowed us to, uh, to get to, uh, to some dedicated tool support that we got in the end. Uh, as far as the state space explosion that, that you see, well, there was the constellations that you saw in the previous slide, which consisted of uh, one sector, FSM. Uh, if you have two sector FSMs, which came closer to reality, actually four, four I think, was more appropriate. Uh, so two sector FSMs uh, in, in the constellation would already give you five million states, and the generation of the state space would be rough, roughly one minute. And that, that was based on BDD tooling. Um, uh, in three, minute, uh, three sectors, that would give you 800 million states already, and the exploration already took 10 minutes or so to, to finish. And extending that to four sectors, that would just take half a day or more. Uh, so some of the sluggishness of this state space exploration here was explained by the fact that the data structures that we needed were actually quite well, quite complex. There was queues involved, there was lots of uh, communication involved, so there was a lot of overhead. Um, uh, so, yeah. And, yeah, okay, so the BDD exploration that we did uh, at that time, currently we can kind of mimic these time, uh, the times that we have here, also using ex uh, explicit state. Uh, exploration techniques. Um, so technology has improved a bit over the years concerning that. We also tried some ad hoc compositional verification techniques, right? So it makes very much sense to, if you have such a hierarchical system, to start somewhere at the bottom and do some, some uh, analysis of the, of the lower levels and then, let's say, using, for instance, uh, branching by similarity or divergence preserving branching by similarity, reduce the behavior of the lower levels and work with the reduced behaviors and propagate that information upwards. And that actually worked to some extent, right? So if you start out on the lowest level, you can kind of create constellations up to 40 FSMs and still analyze them. Uh, but that was far short of the entire subsystem, which uh, of the entire system, because it's got 30,000 systems, uh, FSMs, of course. Uh, so that also didn't seem uh, to be a workable solution. Now, one thing that we noticed during all these analysis and, and through our better understanding in the end was actually the following. So if we had such a program such as this, uh, for a class chamber for instance, there would be a number of states, a number of when clauses in a sense. So when a state is in off, um, and any of the children could be in state on, well, this uh, state machine would actually move to the state standby. And the state standby actually would again uh, inspect what, what its possibilities would be, and one of them would be for instance that if there could be children in state on, um, then it would move to state on. Okay, so there's some overlap here. Uh, so now in state on, if any of the children is actually in state error, then we move to state error. Okay, so once we're in state error, and the children didn't move, uh, one of these didn't move out of state on, in state error, it actually could move back on again to state on. 
so we didn't realize at the time that this was actually an issue, and neither did the engineers understand that this was an issue at that particular point, or at least not understand the, the complications and the implications that, it, that this particular way of programming had. Right? But what you see happening is here that we've stumbled upon a life lock. Um, which you actually can encode as an as a T problem by uh, detecting these types of life flocks. So what we have here, for instance, is you can have this unbounded loop here. So essentially this entire program that we see here would be looping uh, between state off, moving to standby, on, error, and going back again. But it wouldn't do so in every particular configuration. Right? So the challenge here was actually to de detect based on the syntax that we find here, and based on the configurations that we have, whether such life lock would actually be possible. And the local, the, this would allow us actually to do some fairly local analysis. Right? So um, obviously if you have a, uh, a program of this type and it has like n states, then you cannot create any loop that is bigger than n. Obviously it needs to revisit a certain state. So the only challenge here would actually be to see whether we could actually construct such a loop using uh, knowledge about the configurations of the children, right? So in which state they would actually be. And for that, it turns out that you can also construct an upper bound, uh, meaning that, well, we, for every child of a particular type, you needed to have at least one child in, uh, in each of its pos uh, possible states. And if you would have that, you would be able to detect actually all of the life loops uh, that would be possible using such a program. Uh, so this was actually fairly, fairly uh, good observations that we made at the time, and actually, uh, you can uh, uh, using these observations, we were able to analyze the entire system consisting of 30,000 uh, finite state machines for SCMS, and we found that actually 20% of these systems that were that were having some form of logic in there actually were uh, violating these uh, the, this uh, uh, this. Property. Right? So, 20% of these would have these life locks, uh, and the entire analysis of the entire 30,000 systems took place in only 80 seconds, which is a far cry from from the uh, half a day work for for a, a very small constellation yeah, that you have. There were bigger systems such as the LHCB, uh, which somehow surprisingly had far fewer. Uh, of these types of life locks. And it turned out that this was the case because they had a far stricter programming paradigm uh, installed. In, uh, and so also the main developer of this language was actually working for LHCB, so that also might have had some, uh, some consequences there. The total analysis of the LHCB took 120 seconds. There's also another experiment, the Atlas, also only had 0.8 type of the, uh, percent of the finite state machines having some issues uh, and taking about 270 uh, seconds to analyze in, in, in total. Uh, the Alice experiment was also pretty rough, I'd say, with 15% of the system uh, being uh, susceptible to these types of life locks. Now, one may actually wonder whether this would actually explain the phenomena observed in the, uh, uh, in, in the control room. And as we found out, actually, using some of the log files that we retrieved, uh, you would see that indeed this happened. Right? So on some Sunday, November 06, uh, so 6th of November somewhere, um, you would see that some, one of the systems called Pixel Barrel BMI S7 started to oscillate. Right? So it would end up in the analog on red state after which it would immediately switch to the LV mix state and then move back again. And this lasted for up to, uh, well, nearly 20, 15 to 20 minutes. So this is just a small excerpt of the entire log file. And we found more evidence of this type, in, of this kind, in, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the systems. Okay, so we also extended this, uh, this work to discover some non-local life, uh, life locks. Right? So there's, of course, possibility to, that a single FSM has some life lock. But now it's also possible that, it's, uh, that some FSM, together with all its children, end up in some sort of life lock. Right? So one starts sending commands to the other ones, and this command propagates down. Uh, but nothing really happens, and therefore he keeps on sending. And this kind of floods the entire network communication structure that you have. Um, uh, which is also uh, one of the problems that they experiment, uh, experienced. 
Uh, in general, such non-local life locks, they are very uh, difficult and, and expensive to compute. Uh, so essentially, in worst case, you need to traverse the entire state space to find out whether this is actually possible. Uh, but there were some sp uh, special cases for which uh, it was turned out to actually be feasible to analyze this. Uh, so we analyze certain subsystems that are prone to these types of errors, uh, consisting essentially of states that you could detect statically whether they wouldn't change uh, state given a particular action. And then you would search, again using SMT technology, uh, you would search uh, uh, for violations of, uh, of non-local life flocks in this particular case. Uh, so this gave rise to the following number of figures. Essentially, CMS, 69% of all the subsystems that you could identify, and it would, uh, it would have roughly 45 subsystems that we identified. Uh, out of that, 31 had some issues. And the entire analysis there took 75 seconds to do so. Uh, but it didn't always work, right? So for the LHCB, there could only be two uh, subsystems really detected, and that those two subsystems were simply too big still to compute whether they had these type of local, uh, non-local uh, life locks involved. For the Atlas, there was just uh, one big subsystem that we detected, and this one turned out to have one of these life locks. Uh, and the Alice system had uh, uh, 15 subsystems, 13 of which had, li had these life locks. And the, the computation times here were, well, were still okay. Um, tracing back these, these types of life locks to the original system, so detecting that these events really happened in, life uh, in, in the lock files was more tricky, so we we'd actually didn't manage to do that. Um, another property that we found out while formalizing these uh, finite state machines and while formalizing the semantics was actually that it would be very desirable to be able to reach all certain states in these finite state machines from every particular state that you have. Right? So if you're in state on, you want to go to state off at some point. And if you're in off, you want to be able to get to state on. And uh, also for every of the other ones. If not, then somehow your design is very weird. Right? So you don't want that. Um, well, again, if you want it, you can do so using the general uh, MSOL2. Um, well, we could have done so using the general MSOL2 uh, translation that we developed and, and analyzed that using model checking. Uh, what we did was actually something that was a bit quicker in this particular case. So we over approximated the transition relations of these finite state machines, um, just asking whether a particular transition would be satisfiable or not. And we would just draw edges between particular states, right? So you can go from state on to off. Well, yes, it's possible if one of the children is in a certain state. Right? And, and if so, then we draw this edge. And you would be able to do so for every other state. And you would imagine that you would always get a connected graph. Well, turns out not to be the case, right? So there were particular examples that we found that had uh, finite state machines that behaved as follows. So you would be able to go to standby on and off. And, and go from any of these states to the other states. Uh, but once you ended up in a state called ramping or error, there would be no way to get out of that. So this would kind of require some human intervention to, to continue. And this, of course, is not very desirable. So even with an over-approximation of the states of the transition relations, we're able to, to find out such, uh, such issues um, uh, in actually quite decent times, right? So the entire... Uh, uh, structured the entire control system we could analyze with respect to this property in uh, what uh, 61 minute stops for the Atlas system and again the numbers were kind of surprising us right? so you'd see that 10 percent of the system in CMS would have these issues um, LHCB again is one of the uh, the good kids on the block here uh, with only showing three percent of the uh, the FSMs showing any issues uh, but the other ones are also, well, for Alice is nearly 40%, so that was kind of impressive. So, why did we develop this, uh, Dennis? Yeah. A question about the previous slide. You talked about the meaning of the time history. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you mean by the time history? Did it take that many minutes to prove that that percentage was wrong? Yeah, exactly. So the, the entire system was analyzed in 18 minutes, and the analysis resulted in, eight, in, in the verdict that 10% was actually uh, suffering from some issue. Right. Uh, 
so these indeed are the numbers, uh, these time uh, numbers here indicate the analysis of the entire system, not just of a single FSM. What do you mean by Sorry to interrupt, but what do you what do you verify? I mean, it's it's, it's I'm, I'm thinking of model checking. You 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 write your correctness property and you verify it, and outcomes yes or no. But this is this is not a yes or no. This is ten percent is is the answer. So what exactly does verification mean here? Well, it's the reachability violation, right? So it's another approximation of the FSMs that have issues. No, because, as I say, we over-approximated the transition relation in such an FSM, mm -hmm. saying that if there's potential transition between two states, then we're just going to draw this transition. Right? So there might actually be uh, such a transition going there, mm -hmm. in this direction, and then we're just going to draw that. And mm -hmm. that, by itself, should result either in a fully connected graph, and if it doesn't, uh, well, let's say in a strongly SSC it should result into. And if it doesn't, that indicates that there's no way in which you can go to one state and then return to another state, like we see here. Yeah. Right, so going from ramping to error, uh, it's possible. Mm -hmm. But going back to on is impossible. Uh, uh, yes, I understand. So, so you, you, you compute this over approximation, but then in addition you also do, I suppose, an automa automatic analysis of, of reachability. I mean, first of all, you construct the, the, the graph with the transitions, mm -hmm. but then uh, I suppose you're not going to do it manually by inspection. You, you have some other algorithm that checks reachability, sort of that everything is strongly connected. Is that included in those 18 minutes? So uh, this, this entire transition relation is, is the, essentially the uh, computed using an over approximation using SMT, right? Uh -huh. So whether there are transitions here. Okay. Then second of that, there's actually an SEC decomposition. If you yeah. find more than one component, mm -hmm. that means that you, you get potentially yeah. you get into issues, right? Yeah. So then there's a bigger question of whether those situations would ever be reachable. <laughs> um, well, that's harder to answer because in that case you would really need to go through the reachability of the entire control system. But given that the sensors and the hardware actually is supposed to act totally unpredictable and any potential state is possible, this information also propagates upwards in the other direction. So having such situations actually is likely to occur, right? So it's possible in this particular FSM that all of a sudden you're in ramping and there's no way in which you can get out of ramping anymore in this particular FSM. And that's the analysis that we conducted, right? So in 10% of the FSMs, it's impossible to go from certain states back to certain other states. And this in, this in itself was considered to be design flaws. Thanks. Right, so does that answer yep. the question? Yep, pretty much. Okay. Uh, so it, it, the, ex the analyses that we conducted are uh, approximations in, in some of the cases, right? Still. Uh, they took them very seriously. Um, what we did in the end was actually integrate all this stuff into uh, their development environment, so they would just be able to develop their finite state machines, and with the push of a button, analyze whether it would have certain uh, reachability issues or whether it would have certain life locks issues, right? So there would be uh, uh, output of a tool saying that there is a, uh, a loop in a certain clause that the engineer would not expect, and he would be able to fix his system in that way. Okay, so this, this actually helped improve the uh, quality uh, of, of the FSM system, the control system, and in the end, the engineers were quite enthusiastic about this. Right? So we can kind of claim here that the uh, that uh, that the formal methods put uh, helps uh, find the Higgs boson in a certain sense, right? Using this. We, we won. Right. Uh, so some of the other challenges that I wanted to talk about, and I see I don't have much time to do that actually, is the uh, the one that involves protocols for distributing the workload that they have in this uh, in these finite state machines, and actually more in the uh, not so much in the finite state machines in themselves, but more in the data that they produce. Uh, so as some of you might know, actually the data that is being produced here at CERN is being shipped off to all places all over the world. Right, so you've got, uh, and, and this, this is done through the um, uh, uh, Large Hadron Collider grid that they have, uh, the computation grid. So essentially tier 
note that we have here is, is CERN and it would send out its information and ship the information that it has to the tier one sites, um, which would typically be 10 or 12, uh, 12 of these. And it would distribute the information again to lower level uh, tiers, uh, the tier two systems, right? And the global uh, the global data transfer that happens on the on such a grid will be in the order of 12 to 15 billion bytes per second, so, which is like three full DVDs that you send out every second, which is quite quite impressive, right? Um, and all this data actually needs to be analyzed and stored uh, for for conducting well, for doing the physics uh, experiments and, and analyzing what are the, for instance, the Higgs boson is part of the uh, of the event that was recorded recorded during one of the collisions uh, in in the LHC. Right? So each collision, for instance, would already end up with uh, producing one megabyte of data, and it would be typically 600 uh, million events, uh, uh, such events that would happen. Uh, per second, right? and all this data needs to be processed. And obviously, uh, you cannot do that in, in just a single location. So what they did is actually produce uh, some kind of grid and to, to spread the workload here. Uh, not just that, they also built an entire infrastructure around that. It's called the DRAC, which is distributed infrastructure with remote agent control. And it consists of manage. Well, it essentially takes care of management of jobs, data transfers, recall from tape, production workflow, etc. Right. So it will be used as sitting up, up here, producing data, and it will be used as somewhere else in the world, for instance, uh, that would read data from these resources uh, from the cloud, let's say, or from the computation grid, uh, and it would work on that data, process it, and put it back in the cloud. Um, so the direct system, according to the engineers, actually, was designed, uh, carefully designed to be resilient to any failures that you would find in the ever-changing uh, grid environment. Right? Now, this turned out to be a big claim in the end. Uh, so you, uh, just to show you how much data just goes through this Dirac uh, thing here, this is um, uh, some picture taken in uh, uh, some of the data that was analyzed uh, in 13 weeks uh, from week 45 2014 to week 6 in 2015. You would see that at some point up to, uh, well close up to 60,000 jobs would be executed, or, uh, would be executed simultaneously uh, on this grid. And, so, and, and it would be over 100,000 jobs executed per day during peak processing hours. Uh, so this is the, uh, how it's distributed over the world in a sense. So it's not, you can see it's just widespread. It's not, not very local. Uh, so this Dirac architecture uh, overview is essentially as follows. So you've got the users up here. You've got the, uh, well, some of the users produce the data and they send it to uh, via job submission here. Uh, or they can do some file catalog br uh, browsing and see, well, there's the data I need. I'm going to process it and I'm going to work with that. Uh, and the users can also do that. They can monitor jobs and uh, do some uh, browsing of the files that they've got stored. Uh, and all of that works on, on resources that you have here. So the system itself, the direct system, provides services that users can access. Now, this entire system was built in Python, and it consisted of 150,000 lines of code, uh, based on, uh, and it would actually uh, query uh, some kind of big uh, distributed database using SQL uh, to achieve its, uh, its, its, uh, the analysis that we have. Uh, so that kind of sounds like paradise, but it, in the end, it really wasn't because it was trouble in paradise. Uh, the tasks that users submitted occasionally became stuck, uh, or other things that could happen would be that jobs they submitted would fail, and then all of a sudden continue magically. Right? So this is something you don't want, at least it messes up with your entire workflow, um, which is actually quite harmful for the, uh, for the resources that you have, both in computing but also in manpower. Right? Uh, an issue here was actually that this is a distributed system, right? So analyzing a distributed system is quite hard. You can just go through the code and you can try to understand what's going on, but it doesn't give you the full overview that model checking, for instance, would give you, or formal methods would give you. Uh, so this is actually why we put some formal methods uh, against this system. So the entire system consisted of a number of uh, subsystems. Two of the most important ones were the workload management system, 
um, and the storage management system, which interacted in in uh, in, in consynchrony, you would say there would be callbacks. So there would be some uh, sorry, there would be some jobs uh, coming into the workload management system. Uh, which would uh, at some point be needing to be scheduled and if the scheduler would detect that the job wouldn't be available at that particular point in the job database, it would actually go down to the storage management system, hand over the token to that particular subsystem, ask it to analyze the, uh, to, to retrieve the job in a sense if it was already present, or at least the information that you would have, and that would ultimately recall, uh, come back via the callback that you would have here. And it would be some, some slow tape machines running in the back end here. Uh, so the storage management system, this is the first one I'm going to talk about here. Internally, um, it consisted essentially of a number of communicating uh, um, uh, agents. Uh, so these agents could be in a number of states. It could be uh, new jobs arriving in that, and there could be problematic catalog entries, and then the job would essentially fail. Or the job could be in the file catalog, and then uh, you could be waiting, uh, but then the file would be unavailable on storage, and you would fail nevertheless, right? So, and so on, and so forth. Until at the end, well, either you end up in failed, or and then too bad, or you would end up in deleted, uh, which means that actually it was successful. Right? So you managed to go through the entire uh, scenario, and uh, uh, the job would be uh, uh, finished. Right? At some point here, uh, if it's um, uh, waiting, it would actually be submitted to the second submachine that would be there, second state machine, the stage requests uh, state machine, and that one would actually be staging uh, files, which is actually asking the disk to load, to upload, the, uh, to provide the information and give the information back to the, uh, to the users. We did some modeling in MSRL2 of this particular thing, so that uh, of the SMS, for instance. This one was actually particularly small. It was two and a half uh, thousand lines of Python code, uh, resulting in roughly 450 lines of MSRL2 code, of which more than half was involving the uh, data that you would need to manipulate uh, in, in this particular system. Uh, it would result in roughly 18,000 uh, states if you would do the space, uh, state space exploration. Uh, so we used some model checking uh, to analyze this uh, particular protocol, uh, but actually it wasn't really needed for this particular uh, subsystem because already visualization revealed and explained why certain jobs, for instance, got stuck. Uh, so for that we used a tool called uh, uh, Diagraphica, which allows you to project onto certain state properties. And here you would see actually that a job would be able to start, it would uh, come up to new, and then all sorts of transitions would be possible. So these, these arcs that you see here, you should read them clockwise, meaning that you go from this state to that state, and the width somehow indicates how many transitions there would be in the transition system. Uh, so you would see that you could go here and here, or you could go from the new state to the stage submitted state, and in the stage state, you could go to the deleted state. But there was one thing that, wasn't, uh, that couldn't be explained using the diagram that we saw in the previous slide. Namely, you could go from new to state called done. Now, no one in the program, uh, or in this, uh, well, actually in the, in the program itself, took care of what had to be done when a, state, when a job ended up in state done. Now, the case when you end up here wasn't some, some let's say, happy flow uh, going on there. Uh, it really required a special circumstance, in which case, uh, if a job enters, at some point, the, a new job happens, and then if a queue would be full, and it would, uh, other agents would already be processing certain data, the requested data, in that case, rather than being marked as deleted, uh, saying that, well, that we've, we're done with the job, they would actually uh, say the job is done, which is something that wasn't really proper, right? So the, this bug was actually fairly easily fixed just by uh, replacing the done here with the deleted, and the system wouldn't show this issue anymore. There was a um, visualization that actually led to the trace, uh, so this is a 3D visualization of the state space, and this is exactly where the state changes happen. You can indicate that using a, a bunch of colors. You can say these states have this particular property, these states have that particular property, and then any transition between these two would actually indicate where you could already find your issues. 
and you could pinpoint one of these blobs here that would indicate a state, you could find a trace back and this would give you a counterexample. Or actually an example in this case why things go wrong. Uh, something more tricky happened with the workload man management system and given time I'm just going to quickly go through that. So again, they were kind enough to provide one of these uh, diagrams indicating how the, the happy flow work sh uh, workflow should actually go. So there's a number of states that you can go through and there would be two terminal states, either done or failed. However, some people were kind enough in, uh, already some time ago to, to take Picture, uh, to take a picture of the, uh, essentially a screenshot of what happened in practice because uh, you would see here that the system would be logging information saying that at some point some job has failed and then all of a sudden it revises and be becomes done. Right? Which is kind of strange because this means that the system decided that something went wrong and after all continues to work with that and says that something went right after all. So this, these were colloquially called zombies there. Uh, and uh, this is typically something you don't want. Uh, but they couldn't explain exactly why this happened. Uh, so we modeled the entire system again in Amstel 2. Uh, this were roughly 15,000 lines of Python code this time, resulting in roughly 700 lines of Amstel 2 code. Uh, the system was big bigger than, uh, a bit bigger than the previous one, 160 million states, and using uh, LTS min as a backend, the generation of the state space was rather quick, I think within a minute or so. Um, and we find a number of issues. Uh, for instance, the terminated tasks, they can still linger in the system, and deleted tasks, that means finished tasks, uh, they can still be referenced, which is something you don't want as well. Uh, so that had to do with race conditions. Uh, the zombie jobs that were revealed uh, and explained, uh, those were actually revealed and explained using model checking. Um, but those turned out to be difficult to fix in that particular ar architecture that they had. Uh, so they, if they would do that, if we, they would try to fix that in the current architecture, um, it would actually cause severe penalty uh, to performance of the system. Right, so just to illustrate that we could identically replay this entire lock that we found here with MSL2, you would see here this line here with the job fails told job, uh, where it's failed, and here all of a sudden it becomes done. Right, so it's exactly the same as what you see here. Uh, so this allowed them, also the engineers actually, to, to be convinced of indeed the modeling is correct, and indeed this, is, uh, this could be one of the root causes. Now the root cause in this particular case, this particular example, was that one of the engineers manually re, uh, deleted one of the tasks, and then when the callback came, it didn't take this into account. Right, so, it, so the fix for that was uh, was pretty easy. Uh, but fixing uh, the more the, the, this didn't entirely eliminate this particular bug. And as I already said, fixing it actually leads to uh, to performance penalty that you get in the system. Uh, so for that way, for that reason, they re-engineered their system using some kind of executor dispatcher. Um, and, uh, well, that one turned out to have some issues as well. Uh, we fixed those, and now the system is actually up and running. Okay, so uh, I think I'm already over time, so I just wanted to go through a number of things that we um, learned from this case study in the end. Uh, so obviously we, we have now a very big, and this is the last one here, extremely be uh, challenging benchmark case for model checking, right? So MSL2 is able to produce, to generate state spaces for rather large constellations up to now, uh, as of now, but still the entire state space generation of the 30,000 states is not possible. Of the 30,000 FSMs and analyzing them entirely within MSL2 is still not uh, th something we can do up to this point, but using dedicated tool support we actually can do that. Right? Uh, obviously the challenge is to actually go uh, and try and develop the techniques that allow us to do analysis of this particular type uh, on this full state uh, on this full uh, control system, uh, and, and we're working on that. So there has been some BDD-like tooling uh, that was developed by uh, Jakob van der Poel and, and a PhD student of mine, uh, Gijs Kant. Uh, so where they actually generate and, and solve symbolic parity games, and this was uh, published in Graphite. Uh, there was um, inspired uh, by the BD, uh, inspired by the 
SMT encodings that we found in the uh, uh, that we find useful in the uh, life log detections, there was actually the integration of SMT solving uh, for fixed point logics, uh, the parameterized Boolean equation systems I was talking about. Also, theories uh, for abstraction, which we didn't yet apply to this uh, control system, which we are very happy to do uh, at some point, uh, see whether that actually makes sense and whether that produces some, uh, some extra power that we need. And uh, we, we, in the meantime, introduced a number of additional powerful static analysis techniques in, uh, in MSOL2 as well, all because of the case studies that we've encountered. Okay, so that was actually it. Uh, so there's nothing left to but to thank you for listening. So we are slightly over time, but I think we have some time for uh, one or two questions still. Uh, I have a question. So you um, you mentioned that uh, you have w what have we learned from this case study and what challenges do we have? Uh, what have the engineers learned from this? So in what way has it changed the way they work? Um, I'm not sure if it has changed the way they work. Uh, so first of all, the engineers at CERN uh, being Physicists, I think they're kind of inclined to already think in terms of all sorts of mathematical notation. So when we presented these types of analysis, they weren't afraid and ran away, but actually they embraced it. So they said, okay, process algebra looks cool, it looks interesting. Uh, SMT solving looks interesting. So they were actually quite open to all these technologies. Um, some of them at the beginning were quite skeptical, among others, the developers, uh, the developer, main developer, I should say, of this SML language. Uh, she was really uh, skeptic that we could actually find some of the root causes in this system, but in the end she actually completely turned and said that it's just a, a great job and uh, we've, we're gladly integrating this in our development system. So, in, so that, in that sense it has changed, so they, they are using it now themselves? Indeed, yes. So they, they see the added value of using these tools now. Maybe more. To hook into that, um, the, um, the the lead developer of uh, that detector, um, uh, I showed her one of the the, the local uh, live logs that we uh, that our tools predicted, and she didn't really believe it. Uh, but two days later, she came to me and said, "Yeah, actually, last night we saw one of that happening in the control room." So then she was convinced. Yeah. So. Uh, I think indeed the fact that they see these issues also happening uh, and, and it's constantly happening and it's actually a big experiment so it's, it's likely to happen and that you run into issues, these types of issues, that also makes them very susceptible and open to, uh, to using this type of technology. So that's a wonderful crowd to work with. So let's thank the speaker again. Also, this present. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. wonder what's in there. <laughs>